Um, I'll talk about that again in a sec. Are we doing? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, next up, does anyone know Andrew Goldsmith? He just graduated last year in the co-turn program. And so we had this daylighting system, and we played Pong. Actually, that was Andrew pulling this off. And then for his master's thesis, he took his daylighting system and said, yeah, architecture, I don't care about that. I like playing video games. Um, can we make a video game using a lot of the infrastructure on the, on the tabletop? And so he made a little war game uh, with interesting terrain and walls that were obstacles, and then little army men painted in two different colors, and you place them on the map, and if they're close enough to each other and they have a clear line of sight, then they can go into combat. And can we help enforce the rules using the computer and make it a nice, elegant um, interface so that you know, non-experts with computer interfaces could still have fun playing this game? So here's the tabletop with no um, projection on it. Again, that's the raw terrain up at the top. And then you can augment it by putting, say, textures on the sides of the walls, um, uh, make it look like buildings and things like that. So this is just, just to help the ambiance in the, in the space, putting some texture on the surfaces. And then this is a visualization of what it might look like during gameplay. So this is the red person's turn. The X's are where the character started the turn. And these circles are saying where you can move each one of these players. And so if you're familiar with these little tabletop games, there's a rule each turn you can move a certain distance across the field. Um, the computer will help you verify that you've done legal moves. And so you can't cheat and move a person too far. The computer will check out that. Yeah? Just a quick question. How many projectors are producing that image in two? Or uh, actually, this is. Six. We've done four, six, and ten. <laughs> when we, we had ten going in impact once, and that was a bit of a... So yeah, there's six, and they might not be perfectly aligned, and there's some shadows and things going on, and those are all small details. Um, so here's another visualization of, you know, now this is the green person's turn. Um, again, where the people currently are, uh, their movement, their legal movement circles, and then the yellow line they're visualizing who they have a line of sight to and could compete with in the next combat round, which is coming up soon. So again, this helps you plan where to move your characters, helps you see you know, where you might have walked yourself, you know, just so you can understand how the gameplay is going and plan accordingly. So this is a neat little game you put together and um, uh, using, again, all the infrastructure we've had for the previous system. So overall, applications of this sort of spatially augmented reality uh, work education and training, collaborative design environments, uh, data exploration and discovery, and of course entertainment. Not one of my top priorities, but it's seeming to sneak in there with the games. Um, I'll just briefly talk about the next thing we're doing, adding to this system, which is the, the laser pointer interaction. So a lot of times in our interfaces, we wanted some other way to communicate with the system. It's almost been like, yeah, if I had a pointer, I would draw where I wanted the window on the wall. I'm standing in the space, you know, can't I just point? And people have done some of this work already, gesture recognition when you're standing in these spaces. And so we started playing around with the laser uh, pointer for this. And also for the game, it might be nice, hey, tell me more data about this particular person. If you could point or circle that person, that would be helpful. And so we started work on this um, initially just on a single surface. And uh, uh, we had multiple lasers, actually. We're doing multiple person collaboration, one of the little simple demos. We moved up from our five-piece jigsaw puzzle and we've done larger versions. Uh, this one, I think we had 12 people working on a uh, 10 by 10 jigsaw puzzle, and they solved it. I don't have a timer running, so I can't say what it was, but um, it's a nice, you know, there's not just one mouse connected to the computer anymore. Essentially, there's 12 mice, and or we need scale more, we had more lasers, um, but to move around the pieces and solve puzzles. And we had another one for showing uh, data visualization, we just put a giant graph, of in this case, the mammals, actually the whole animal kingdom. And a couple simple interactions. If you circle the node, it would expand it and show you all the things underneath it. You could grab on a node and rearrange it if you didn't like how it was currently laid out. And then you could also scribble on something to say, collapse this node and um, decrease what's going on. So just simple graph interaction, again, in this multi-person uh, environment. OK, so let's talk about open source. So we put together this huge system. We couldn't have done it on our own, writing everything from scratch. So. Off the top of my head, these are the things I remember that we use. There's probably more stuff. If I talk to the students, you probably get a longer list here. Uh, but open source stuff we have used. Um, AR toolkits, anyone heard of that? Um, these are some pictures from that. It allows you, it's a system you can build, uh, print out these little um, barcode markers. And again, this is a typical augmented reality, often used in an augmented reality sense, where you're one person wearing a head-mounted display. The camera sees these barcode markers in the scene and then adds 
virtual stuff into your field of views. In this case, adding a little person on the top that the person holding the card with the barcode marker can see. Uh, or, you know, putting a little person on your desk and with video conferencing. Uh, we ended up not using this system at all because in our environment, it would have been really awkward to put these relatively large barcode tags on all of our walls and stuff. So we ended up not using it, but it was inspirational to get us there. Um, camera projector calibration. This is a giant nightmare for people who do computer vision work. And I'm a graphics person. I didn't want to do computer vision. Um, not that it's just hard to see. It's a lot to do stuff. So it was great. We were able to grab a lot of people's um, open source code to do various uh, pieces of the calibration. There was one thing that was a Windows executable, and it was a real nuisance. It didn't really work perfectly. Um, but again, if we had to write that from scratch, we would not have even gotten past step one here. Uh, CGAL is a great computational geometry license, or excuse me, algorithms library or something it stands for. Uh, the license is a little bit intimidating. It's one of these open source unfortunate things where too many people's licenses got com combined, and uh, it's kind of scary when you read through it. We're not necessarily intimidated by it, but you basically can't commercialize anything when you use this, uh, which is not surprising with open source, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we used a whole bunch of other open source stuff, and this is incomplete, as I said before. So again, we couldn't have pulled this off without open source. Um, things we could, should, will open source, and this is where I have to apologize. We haven't done it yet. Um, I'll, be, I'll put my excuses later. But the pieces that I think will be helpful to, to put out there and share uh, would be our calibration infrastructure. You know, we use a lot of other people's pieces, but how we put it together might be helpful for someone else who's putting together a, a spatially augmented reality system. And so here are just some of the pieces again. In order to get full calibration in MPAC, we did all kinds of crazy things, putting markers on the floor, um, devices that were put all over the place. And this is again to get the projectors and cameras in alignment. Uh, to track our physical objects, so we actually had two systems. One was the small scale. Uh, using color, and the second one is the larger scale and impact using LEDs. And so there's some, some algorithm stuff there we've described in papers, but it would be nice to share the source code uh, for that as well. Uh, our, specifically for architecture, to help interpret what people build, either on the table or in uh, full scale. Uh, these are the modules that we've seen laid out in the table. If we ask the artist who, drew, who laid them on the table, this is the space they wanted to convey. How do we automatically create the image on the right, which is determining inside versus outside? For just four walls made into a square, it's really easy. For something more complicated like this, it took some work to get that, that answer over that right. And there's certainly cases where what people build is quite big. Uh, but that would be code we can share. Um, we have a program that we call the Remesher that does everything in the kitchen sink related to triangle models. Uh, I don't know how useful this would be outside because it does have a lot of overlap with the Seagal library. But again, it's something that could be shared. And then um, the projector calibration or compensation, which I talked about. Uh, again, we've published all of the, the algorithms, but it would be nice to share the source code, especially since it's this big mix of GPU code and everything coming together. Um, and then the laser tracking stuff, which we're still currently working on, could be nice to share as well. So now this is my excuse slide. Why haven't we done this yet? Number one thing is time. Uh, have to balance needing to do research, students who need to graduate. Uh, with development. And this is producing functional, stable code. So there's a big difference between making it work for an example to publish a paper and putting it out there in a form that other people could use it. Um, another one is pride. We need to get over this, I guess. Don't want to release poorly written or broken code. I don't know what the solution is then. You know, David kind of mentioned this as well. You know, if we put it out there, we don't want to maintain it, right? Uh, we don't want people sending us email that's broken, like, yeah, we know it's broken. It works for some examples. Um, and then the big thing, too, is usefulness. Some modules are too specific to our application and setup. And I'd almost feel like we want to you know, rip out the pieces that are specific and get it down to the core that actually might be useful to someone. And again, this comes back to the time point. How do you pull out the piece and isolate the module that is really useful and you want people to, to share from something specific to make the examples work? You know, Because we're doing architecture. Maybe someone wants you know, the general game infrastructure. Now that we've taken the architecture and programming, He's made the video game thing for it. Maybe we figured out what the important components are. But again, separating that just takes time. So that's why we haven't done it yet. Um, excuses. Um, and I guess I'm done. So these are the students who've worked with me on the project. I want to thank them and, of course, funding people and them back. And thank Morthy for inviting me and all of you for listening. So I, I just want to tell you why I, the students and I developed a software some 17 years or 15 years ago. 
and we put the software more open source and public, in public domain at that time, we, you know, we didn't worry about. And uh, a couple of days ago, I got a telephone call from University of Connecticut Health Center saying that they want to use the system. Can, can they use it? Please tell me it is public domain. So I contacted the student and it was public domain. Little did I know that the software that was, I thought it was, uh, who is going to use it? Some, it is a part of a big <coughs> system. So in general, rule of thumb, I said to myself is, there are other creative people that they can oh, yeah. do better than uh, what I could ever think of. So, and one place I've seen this a lot is in architecture. You go visit people just down the way in the green building. Which way am I pointing the right yeah, way? This is, this is green. green building. Yeah, that's green building. Um, they get tools and they use them in ways that we weren't expecting people to use them at all. They do crazy things with them, and it's almost like I don't want you to design a building with that. It's not certified. It's not safe. But they're just using it to in creative ways to, to you know. That's pretty cool. So we should. These are yeah. lame excuses. We should get over this. But uh, it's more important now that you have the tenure. Okay, we'll just publish it. Oh, gee, she got a tenure uh, just now, so congratulations. Uh, so, so, uh, interestingly useful, that's Thank you very much. Okay. 